Welcome, everyone, to Genetic Alliance webinar series. This is our Innovator series, which is our look at the year. This is our 25th anniversary, and we wanted to focus on innovation, and especially looking forward and not looking backwards over the last 25 years, but forward to what is coming. We're very privileged today to have uh, John Halamka, who's the Chief in Information Officer at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, and also the Chief Information Officer for Harvard Medical School, the Chairman of the New England Healthcare Exchange Network, and the Co-Chair of the National HIT Standards Committee, uh, and he's also a practicing emergency physician. John's going to share with us today about information exchange and the challenges that we see ahead. And uh, again, if you have questions, certainly put them in the little box where it says uh, chat there, and the organizers and I will rearrange them so that they make logical sense to ask John at the end of his presentation. So John, welcome, and take it away. Great. Well, thanks so much, and very happy to be here. And so what I thought I would do to give you guys a grounding in everything that has gone on over the course of the last two years in the federal government is give you 2,000 pages of regulations in 25 minutes or less. It's going to be great. Uh, we're going to take a quick look at the so-called meaningful use regulation, a little bit about the standards. But then I think it's important as we look forward to look at what 2013 and 2015 will bring in terms of IT functionality, and then talk a little bit about the standards that are going to be necessary to ensure we all get to a cannibal care nirvana, where everyone has the right information at the right time that empowers doctors to make the right decisions and keep us well rather than just treat disease. Now, unfortunately, I have a little interoperability problem, which is I created this presentation today in a Macintosh version of a presenter software product. It doesn't quite look right as we play it out in PowerPoint, but I think it'll be fine. Okay, so let's move forward. So what is this concept of meaningful use? You probably have heard this term, and two years ago, those two words, meaningful and use, were never used together. But the idea is pretty simple. Rather than pay doctors for acquiring hardware and software, we really want to make policy change. We want to ensure quality, safety, and efficiency. So how can we as a country create a set of principles that reimburse hospitals and doctors for using IT widely, not just acquiring hardware and software? The idea, of course, is if your brother-in-law Bob creates a wonderful piece of software in Microsoft Access, in fact, it runs on DOS, maybe that's not good enough. It isn't about acquiring hardware and software. It's truly getting reimbursed for impacting quality and safety. So again, what meaningful use is, it's a policy construct. It's we are going to give doctors 44,000 each or 63,750 if they have more than 30% of their patients that are Medicaid patients once they have demonstrated some 15 required characteristics and five of 10 core characteristics of maps can be menu characteristics for using electronic health records wisely. And there'll be money for hospitals as well, roughly $2 million a year per hospital for a total of five years. So in order to claim the stimulus, you need to be a appropriately licensed, eligible professional. You need to be a hospital or critical access hospital. You need to have records that are appropriately functional, a certified electronic health record and you must be using it in a meaningful way. Only then will you qualify. So let's look at what meaningful actually means. So when this policy was crafted, the idea was we want to address five key areas. Quality, safety, efficiency, those are very important, as well as reduction of disparities of care. So we want to ensure that as we are capturing data about patients, we look at race, ethnicity, gender, primary language, and we make sure that the same quality of care is being delivered across the community. Because this is truly about bending our cost curve, improving the value of care, reducing redundancy and waste as we get forward in healthcare reform, which is more about reimbursing for quality than quantity. There's been a traditional problem in American healthcare of not really engaging patients. Now, just to give you an example from a HIPAA perspective, I give everybody on the call absolute release of any confidentiality that me or my family may have regarding our own health care issues. My mom was recently hospitalized with a gangrenous gallbladder. She was discharged from the hospital. 
after she was discharged, she had no idea what a gallbladder did and how it would impact her diet or her lifestyle or what follow-up she might have or what, say, activity restrictions she should have. So we should really ensure that inpatient, outpatient, and emergency department care engages patients and their families so there can be decision-making between provider and patient. We want to ensure care coordination. Let's say in Massachusetts, where I'm from, 15% of our care is redundant and wasteful. You go to the Brigham Women's Hospital and get an MRI. You then go across the street to Beth Israel Deaconess and get another MRI. And gee, that's good because both radiologists get paid. But for you, the patient, it's bad because you're getting conceivably a risky test, conceivably radiation exposure, and certainly this is bad for society because it's redundant and wasteful. As a country, we're not so good about looking at population health and public health. We've got huge issues with diabetes and obesity and lethargy. And how do we ensure, especially those chronically ill across society, are kept well? We need to look beyond a single practice and look at our entire population. We should have the tools to do that. But of course, privacy and security must be protected. It must be foundational that data is only reused for whatever, clinical research or clinical trial, only with patient permission. It is only shared with patient permission. i give you an example. Each of us may have very different privacy preferences. So some folks who know me recognize that as one of the early participants in the Personal Genome Project, my genome and my full medical record is available on the web. My stem cells are available to researchers. I have elected to effectively uh, re eliminate any privacy restrictions because I believe in the altruistic contribution of my medical data and genomic data to society. But everyone will have a different preference. Some may release everything, some may release nothing, and some may release data for a given purpose depending on what that purpose might be or who the viewer may be. If you're an emergency department, you might say, Absolutely. All of my most sensitive information, including mental health information or substance abuse information, is released. But if I am, say, seeing a dermatologist, maybe I don't want to release such information. So let's uh, take a look at meaningful use and uh, some of the detail of what are some of the requirements. So first, that we want to make sure, that, as I mentioned, in the interest of disparities of care, that we are, um, for every patient who's registered, gra grabbing demographic data, including race, ethnicity, primary language, and we're going to use that in our quality analysis. We want to ensure that we are using provider order entry, and that is we are going from the doctor's brain to the patient's vein and using electronic systems without intermediaries or handoffs so that the right medications, the right labs, the right radiology tests are ordered on the right patient. We want to pay particular attention to medication safety issues, including drug-drug and drug allergy checks as each medication is prescribed. We want to use e-prescribing and routing electronically to retail pharmacies. We want to make sure we have a problem list on every patient. So we look at the whole care of the patient and not just a particular issue they may have today. We want to ensure each patient has a comprehensive medication list and that's reconciled with what they're really taking and that we document allergies. And it's important to document not only the substance but the reaction and how certain you are about that reaction. We also want to document vital signs and in particular body mass index because if we're going to deal with the issue of obesity in the United States, it's important that we actually have some data by which we can look at the weight and height of a patient over time and offer them lifestyle counseling or at least inform them that their body mass index is heading into obesity. Now let's, uh, smoking status. In addition to diabetes, obesity, lethargy, smoking is certainly a significant issue in this country, and we want to document who's a current smoker, who's a former smoker, who's a heavy smoker, and that's uh, a requirement from an EHR meaningful use perspective. We want to offer good decision support, and that is make sure doctors are given timely information of the right best practice based on evidence 
so that they can take the data they enter into an electronic health record and turn it into information, knowledge, and wisdom. We want to measure quality, and specifically there are 15 quality measures for hospitals and 44 quality measures for ambulatory sites, and there'll be more going forward just to make sure that the process and outcomes of care are as good as they can be. We want to ensure that patients can get a full electronic copy of their lifetime health record upon request. Sometimes hospitals and doctor's offices have locked that information away. We want to ensure that patients add, on leaving a um, outpatient visit or an inpatient stay get a copy of the discharge summary or clinical summary. And we want to share data between providers to eliminate that redundancy and waste, to, imp to improve care coordination and to close the loop. If somebody has a disease, they're referred to a specialist. The specialist has no idea why they are showing up. It's clear they're not going to receive good care. And of course, back to that privacy and security item, we want to ensure that all of our enterprises have had up-to-date security analyses to make sure the data that we store about patients is protected. Now there are a series of what are called menu set or optional items for which a provider or hospital has to choose five. So we want to implement drug formulary checks to make sure that patients are getting those medications that are going to be reimbursed by their insurance company. We're going to want to document advanced directives. What are your preferences for care? Do you have a healthcare proxy? Do you want to be intubated? What are your preferences? And let's sure, ensure we adhere to your preferences, especially around end-of-life care. We want all lab data to be electronic. And this implies whether that's a genetic, genetic test or whether it is a urinalysis of blood test. We want data in structured form in our laboratory systems. We should be able to look beyond the care of an individual patient to be able to look across the panel of patients. Say a primary care doctor wants to identify all diabetics with a hemoglobin A1C above 7 as maybe those are the folks who need to come in more often because they have issues with glucose control. We want to be able to send alerts and reminders to patients. It's time for that uh, pneumovax. It's time for a colonoscopy or mammogram. Ensure that patients are coming in for their wellness care. Ideally, we want to give patients online access, not just summaries at each episode of care, but a web-based mechanism for patients to look at their record and participate in decision making. And that might include secure email, it might include the ability to make appointments online or renew uh, medications. If it's possible to do e-banking, it should be just as possible to do e-medicine. We want to make sure that any time we share data with patients, we're doing it in a way that patients can understand. Doctors tend to speak in a variety of sophisticated acronyms. And how, if we're going to share records with patients, can we wrap those in a context that makes the data actionable? Telling a patient their cholesterol is 200 is meaningless unless you tell them what the normals are and why it matters that a cholesterol should be less than 200. We want to make sure that every transition of care from inpatient to outpatient, emergency department to home, has medication reconciliation so that we're uh, completely certain of what medications you take and not take. In the case of my mother's recent hospitalization, uh, the hospital retrieved a list of all of her medications from a payer database. So it shows that over the last 20 years, she's been prescribed 17 medications. That doesn't really help you to understand what she actually takes and for what reason. When we transition uh, patients from, say, a hospital to a skilled nursing facility, you want to make sure their record follows them. And it's key that summaries of care are following the patient wherever they go. And for public health, we want to make sure that every patient has their immunization data submitted to an immunization registry so that we can track that the community is appropriately immunized, but also in the future that if a doctor wanted to retrieve a comprehensive lifetime immunization record to make sure you're up to date, that would be possible. We want to send reportable lab results to public health, and we want to do syndromic surveillance. If it's normal for 10 patients with cough to show up in an emergency department on a given day, 
and suddenly a hundred show up, that's an indicator that we might have H1N1 or some other issue in the community and public health needs to take action quickly. So that's a look at meaningful use stage one, 2011. But what will 2013 and 2015 bring? All of those items that I just went through that were called menu set, you had to pick five out of the 10. All 10 are now required. So that is by 2013, they're going to be moved to the core and every physician and every hospital are going to have to do those things. You'll also see, a, and this is proposed, but as it comes out in final regulation toward the end of the year, it's likely that many of the percentages I showed on those slides, that is, did you prescribe up to 40%, they're going to be moved to 50% or 80%. We're going to eventually get up to the 80 and 90th percentile for every one of those measures that I showed you. Now, it may be challenging for specialists especially to keep problem lists and medication lists and allergy lists up to date, but the hope is, is that you have increasing requirements for care coordination, medication reconciliation, care planning, and summaries of every visit, that there will be a workflow in each office that ensures the database is up to date. Now, I've suggested that wouldn't it be wonderful if each of us had an electronic medical home as part of a movement to a patient-centered medical home so that our primary care doctors could receive all the data, assemble all the data, and then share it out to specialists. That's one model. Another model is that each of us has a personal health record, and all of our data is sent to the personal health record after every transition of care. But with stage two and stage three, more and more data will be stored with our consent about us to ensure good care coordination. Now, we also want great decision support. I mentioned this earlier. I mean, the challenge is that there's more literature published every year than a doctor can read in a lifetime. So we need to have actionable decision support at the point of care so that when doctors make a difference, the rules and the knowledge come together with the data to make something actionable. And that decision support just can't be a couple of docs got together on a weekend and thought, this is a good thing. No, the decision support should be evidence-based, literature-based, with sources cited. It should be context-sensitive to the patient. Describing something about a 48-year-old male would be applicable to me if it's decision support about pregnancy, it is highly unlikely to be useful to me. It should invoke the relevant knowledge, not just all the data about the patient. That is, what aspects of that data are relevant for a particular action. It should be an alert or reminder. That is, if it's emergent, it should be escalated to the doctor via cell phone or some emergent communication modality. If it's a reminder, like get a Pneumovax this year, fine. It should be timely, and that should be presented maybe at the next patient visit. It should be integrated into the workflow, inside the electronic health record, and presented at the right time to the individual who can make a difference. So we'll see more and more decision support in stage two and stage three. Now we're going to want electronic documentation, and so that some of that will be structured, some will be unstructured, like dictations or typed notes, but the fact that it won't be paper that's important. We want to make sure that inpatient documentation also moves to electronic form, although stage two and stage three may provide a scanning option. It's still electronic. Uh, it may start on paper, but we'll eventually want to move away from recording data on paper where only one person can see it at a time and privacy is hard to control. You want to make sure that as a medication is delivered that it has electronic medication administration tracking. So today I know, because Beth is real deaconess uses provider order entry, every med on every patient that's ordered. We also have an automated dispensing mechanism, OmniCell or Pixis. I know when the nurse takes it out. But at the moment, I don't know the, when the pill touched the patient's tongue. And if you barcode the medication, you barcode the patient and barcode the caregiver and scan, scan, scan as the medication is given, you then have closed the loop to ensure the right medication was delivered to the right patient at the right time. You want to ensure that uh, discharge instructions are available electronically for at least 80% of patients. This was a 50% uh, 2011 threshold, so that threshold is going to go 
uh, up and down. It may be a printed piece of paper, or it could be an electronic document put on a thumb drive or put on the patient's personal health record. Those discharge instructions should include current medications, the activities, the diet, follow-up appointments, pending tests, referrals, all those things that my mother didn't get. Ideally, you'd want patients to be able to get their information, inpatient and outpatient, available via a secure website, a personal health record that might be attached to the hospital or doctor's electronic health record, or maybe even a third-party system like Google Health or Microsoft Health that might be a recipient of data on the patient's behalf so the patient can manage their own data. And you'll see, you know, in, in all of these, that there's just more and more patient engagement, inpatient, outpatient, being able to have in a timely fashion all aspects of summaries, and that the patients should be able to use this in an actionable way, be able to filter it and sort it. Ideally, too, patients should be able to email their providers securely, because right now, if you give a patient a complex bit of information that they can't quite understand, they should be able to contact someone electronically to follow up on it. And patients may use all kinds of communication modalities. They might use a voice telephone. They might use a personal health record. They might have a secure email site, Google or Microsoft. So patients should be able to dictate where their information is sent per their preference. Now, this will, of course, have to be uh, limited. It won't be Twitter and Facebook that we're going to be sending information to, but I would guess it would include phone, fax, paper-based email, secure email, and personal health records in stage two and three. Especially concerning in our country are congestive heart failure, COPD, diabetes, patients with chronic diseases these so-called high-priority health conditions, and we want to assure especially that we have care plans and good communication to keep these patients well and out of the hospital. With healthcare reform, we may very well see changes in reimbursement such that recidivism to hospitals, if you come back after a week of being discharged, the hospital's not going to get paid. So very important to coordinate home care and patient communications outside the hospital. I've mentioned many times patient engagement and personal health records, but we should make sure that every electronic health record has the capacity to send data to personal health records. Patients should be able to offer feedback. And so if you're going to measure patient satisfaction, if you're going to have a closed loop system that is constantly a learning healthcare system, patients should be able to provide reviews of their care online. I mean, call this Amazon.com for patients like me. You should have patient-generated data from the home incorporated into electronic health records. So I'll give you an example. I have a scale at home from a French company called Y-Things, W-I-T-H-I-N-G-S. And as I step on the scale every morning, my weight and body mass indexed are transmitted instantaneously to Google Health, and my weight and body mass index are tracked graphically in real time Anytime I bring up my personal health record, I can look at my variation weight over a course of a year. It turns out that I tend during the cold months of winter to put on three or four pounds, and in the warm months of summer to lose those three or four pounds. I can manage my weight and body mass index automatically using telemetry from my home. It would be great if every patient could understand who their care team members are, because in an average hospital visit, you're seen by 12 different folks who are these people? Ah, it's the nurse, the doctor, the resident, the fellow, the dietitian, et cetera. And you should have a care plan to understand how you're going to be kept well in the hospital and outside the hospital when you go home. So that's a quick overview of meaningful use, where stage one is in regulation today, and stage two and three are likely to be, there may be some refinement and the final rule on stage two and three will be written over the course of the summer, and it will, of course, have lots of public comment and feedback, but then will be a notice of proposed rulemaking probably in November or so. So uh, it's coming quite quickly. To complement meaningful use, which is a policy, we need to make sure we have the right technology. 
And so although the HIT policy committee sets meaningful use, we have a uh, correspondent committee, the HIT standards committee, which I co-chair, that helps with standards, certification criteria, the technology side of it. So what have we done over the course of the last year? Well, we've made sure that for meaningful use stage one, that all the standards that are necessary to support e-prescribing and to support clinical summary exchange and to support the various kinds of public health exchanges all are codified in regulation. So you'll see terms like HL7251, CDA or CCD, NCPDP, all these wonderful acronyms, SNOMED, LOINC, etc., to codify the way the data is sent from point A to point B in a way that's semantically interoperable, that is the receiver can understand what information the sender has packaged and delivered. We've made sure that there's flexibility in the way that technology could be acquired so that as cool new iPhone and iPad apps become available, as innovation occurs, it isn't just a giant software company creating a monolithic system that is implemented in doctors' offices, that there's flexibility of getting modular, smaller systems that together provide this functionality we want every doctor to have. We've created a framework for the development of new standards going forward, and there are a number of new projects that uh, are launched against that framework. We figured out a way that data can be sent securely from point A to point B using very simple standards, secure email standards that ensure data integrity and encryption. We've had many, many hearings from stakeholders in the industry, providers, payers, employers, and patients to figure out about what are the barriers to using more electronic health records, exchanging more data, and we provide a significant guidance to the federal government as to how to make these regulations more efficient and easier to adopt. As we think of healthcare reform and the ability to easily get health insurance and understand what your coverage is, we have worked on enrollment standards for health plans, and we've taken many recommendations from the Privacy and Security Tiger team and incorporated them into our work. Now, we look at the year ahead, here are a couple of areas where we would like to enhance the standards used in the country. So what we want to do is ensure that as structured data is sent from place to place, that there are good vocabularies associated with that data so that, for example, when I say I'm allergic to penicillin, we want to make sure that my sending EHR and your receiving EHR understand what an allergy is and what penicillin as a substance or penicillin as a class of substances might be. And so that has required us to make sure that we specify vocabularies such as LOINC and SNOMED and ICD-9 and CPT-4, RxNorm. And there will be increasing numbers of code sets and vocabularies as we do more and more structured data transmission. And we want to make sure those are available in a one-stop shopping location so that a doctor, any stakeholder, can download them and not have significant licensing fees. So we've made several recommendations to the government about how to try to centralize these resources. Already the government has licensed SNOMED on behalf of everyone in the country, so it's downloadable in the US for free. Now if we're gonna protect privacy, one of the problems is how do we know who a doctor really is? And so one way is to issue every doctor in the country a digital certificate so that as they retreat data in a healthcare information exchange, they have to prove their identity. And that requires standards around how certificates are issued and managed. And we have just delivered to the federal government a whole set of guidelines on the nature of digital certificates for electronic signing of records, for authentication and retrieval of records. Now, if we want to send data from Dr. A to Dr. B, we better have some kind of directory so that we understand how to reach organizations and individuals. Again, that's going to require standards on how we create, maintain, add, change, and delete directory information, both of entities and organizations and individuals. So we're currently working on that. And come June, we will have a set of provider directory standards at the entity and individual level. If we are going to exchange data about a patient, we need to figure out how to manage the merging of data across multiple institutions for the same patient. And the problem, of course, in this country is we don't have a national healthcare identifier. 
unlikely that we'll get a national health care identifier. So if we're going to do the next best thing, match name, gender, date of birth, and other demographic data, how do we really ensure that we get high uh, sensitivity and specificity, that is to say very few false positives matching people together who shouldn't be matched? Uh, John Halamka, that's pretty straightforward. There are only a few of us in the country, but if your name is John Smith, how do you ensure the right John Smith's data is aggregated together? So we're working on that. We'll issue a report this summer. If we're going to measure quality from electronic health records, we better have quality measures that are based on data elements that actually exist electronically and are comparable between institutions. So retooling many of our current quality measures. On December 8th of last year, the President's Council of Advisors of Science and Technology issued a report on healthcare IT interoperability and suggested several interesting ideas to protect privacy, to encourage more interoperability, and to provide reuse of data with patient consent in support of clinical trials and clinical research. And this report is currently under review, and come April, there'll be a comprehensive response listing options for the Office of the National Coordinator to incorporate these PCAST ideas into its work. Finally, there is a standard made by HL7 called the Clinical Document Architecture. Such a standard can be used to send summary information like problems and medications. It can also be used to send genetic information. And one challenge with the CDA is it is a bit difficult to use. And so working with HL7, IHE, and other organizations, we have an initiative to simplify the CDA. It's called the Green CDA Initiative. Make it more efficient, make it lighter weight, make it easier as we have many needs in the future to send data and represent content and vocabularies that are going to be used for coordination of care and population health. So quite a rich agenda of making sure that we have all the standards ready for meaningful use stage two and three and a re-emphasis on the need to exchange data for coordination of care and population health. So that's a brief overview of more than 2,000 pages of existent regulation and a preview of regulation to come. And I know there's quite a lot going on in Washington, and many of you are, are following the work of CMS and ONC and others, and I get to live that every day, so I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thanks so much, John. And, and I want to add, I, I serve on the Standards Committee uh, under John's great leadership uh, with, uh, with the other John, as we say. Um, and the kind of commitment he's made to the nation in the, both the care he gives to the committee as well as the intelligence and skill he brings to the things that we're discussing and the, and the decisions we're making is quite phenomenal. And I'm really in awe of your giving beyond your, your day job, so to speak, to this bigger uh, issue. Thanks so much. Happy to serve. And you see, there, I'm not totally selfless because it turns out, as a doctor, I actually have to use these systems. <laughs> and so <you> know, <laughs> right. in, in, in Microsoft terms, I think sometimes they use the expression among their engineering group, eating your own dog food. Well, <laughs> as a doctor I, and a CIO, I have to implement these systems for 3,000 docs and use them every day. So uh, this is truly my contribution on my blog and the National Service is a side effect of just explaining what I'm struggling with locally. Yeah, well, terrific. So we have several questions, and we'll see how many we can get to, and I'm uh, trying to aggregate them into common uh, buckets as I go. Uh, the first one says, uh, this is, for example, an, a visit to an ophthalmologist. Uh, the ophthalmologist said that even with all this, he'll have to maintain a physical file to accommodate things like x-rays on film, DVDs sent to him, written letters, etc., He says that instead of replacing the physical file, it has added the requirement to maintain a new and expensive system in addition. Care to comment? Okay. Well, so as you guys have heard, I'm an emergency physician, I'm a CIO, and I'm a realist. Wouldn't I love to say that we are going to have a completely digital medical world in the next year to two? Well. It is as likely that we'll have a paperless hospital as we will have a paperless bathroom. It is going to be many, many years before we are totally digital. 
And so the, 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 that observer is correct that uh, you're going to have an electronic system that is, say, going to be 80% plus of the data used in your office, but there's still going to be paper coming from the outside. And so you have two choices. You can either maintain that in physical files or you can scan it. And so what Beth Israel Deaconess has chosen to, don, uh, to do, and many, many of its offices do, is they simply create PDFs, scanned representations of all the pieces of paper that come into the doctor's office, and 30 days after paper arrives in a doctor's office, it is disposed of. And so, yes, there's paper workflow, but there's not long-term paper storage. As well, I think the images, uh, we scan 2,000 CT, MRI, and other complex studies every month in at Beth Israel Deaconess, and those go into our, our digital systems for reviewing and retrieval. So there are capabilities of scanning re of images. But I'll say that there probably be another trend that is you're starting to see a number of companies offering what I'm going to call cloud-based image sharing services. So suppose that I have an x-ray at my office and I want to share it with another doctor. I can send that doctor a secure email that gives them a web address with security credentials to retrieve that patient's study. They never have to see a copy of a film. They don't have to store a, anything physical at their location. They can always simply retrieve it from my location via the web. So it's a transition. Uh, this is definitely 20, 2011 through 2015 is a journey. Um, and yes, there will be paper along the way, but hopefully less and less. Yeah, in fact, I had an experience with this recently. My, my husband broke his hand, and in order to see the x-ray at home, they gave him a web address, which was a, a secure uh, place. We logged in, and we could look at the x-ray of his hand. They could share that with the uh, uh, orthopedist when he went, so it was quite good. Okay, another question. Um, given all the errors that we see with security certificates, and I think probably this person means on the web and in various software that we all use, uh, do you have a, a solution for that uh, because it will have effect on interoperability and the sharing of data? Right, and so this is what I'd mentioned is that we have just issued a report. It will be made public at our next meeting, which I think is at the end of the 29th, I believe. Uh, so Sharon, you'll be there, which actually yeah. will describe the prerequisites for every certificate used in healthcare in the country. What field it needs to have, how it should have a root certificate, and how it should be trusted, and who can issue it. And so what you'd hope is that by creating a set of requirements for certificates to be used in healthcare, that you get around some of these problems of certificates issued by authorities who aren't trusted with incomplete information. Um, alas, there's a lot of optionality in the issuing of certificates today, and that's why there's so much variability. We will reduce that optionality. Okay, good. Uh, question, are there any meaningful use criteria that are particularly relevant to genetic information, for example, family history data or genetic testing? So, Although it's not specifically stated in meaningful use stage one, uh, remember, I mean, and your members may know that I'm part of the Personal Genome Project, and therefore my 30 billion base pairs uh, are part of my record. And therefore, when my record is exchanged in summary form, the biomarkers or those things that are relevant to me that come from my genetic testing or analysis should be part of that summary. So when we say there is a requirement to issue a patient's lifetime medical record with salient test results, genetic testing is part of the salient test result. A family history is something that is also part of the continuity of care document. And so, for example, if you look at my continuity of care document, which is on the web, you'll see that my, fa my father has multiple sclerosis, that my mother has non-tropical sprue, that there is a series uh, of data embedded in my care summary that is not only the genetic testing, but the family history that's going to inform my care. Great. Thank you. Another question, a little different uh, uh, 
uh, area. So in America, we often think that our way is the best way. Uh, other countries have health records, uh, and many of those are tied to a unique health identifier. Uh, for example, Germany, France, Great Britain, Canada, Italy, Spain, Taiwan, and Japan, etc. cetera. Uh, what do we think about that, and are we looking to models uh, beyond our borders? So let me answer that in a couple of ways, which is, of course, the United States has much to learn about healthcare from other countries because we deliver the most uh, expensive, um, uncoordinated, and problematic care in the world. I mean, we have lots of the care, but it's not necessarily the best care. So I was in Japan last week. Uh, I met yesterday with folks from China, folks from Denmark. Uh, next week, I meet with folks from Latin America. I know many of the activities throughout the world, and I think what you could say is this. We have a problem with alignment of incentives. So let's take Sweden, for example. The way Sweden's healthcare system works is they have divided the country into 36 county councils. Each county council makes investments in the wellness of the population, but then is responsible for the wellness of the population. So they invest $5 million in IT, and it reduces costs. Great. They keep the savings. And the citizens of the county feel like it is their community responsibility to share their records, to be part of the care coordination process, because they think of the government, oddly enough, as a bank. You know, they're, providing, they're getting social services from the government who is really just handling a pass-through of a good percentage of their income. And so you've got alignment. The people who pay for care, the people who benefit from innovative approaches with IT that save money benefit from them directly. In the U.S., you know, you make a change, see the doctor does the work, the insurance company gets the benefit, and the patient isn't engaged. It's a big problem. So I don't know that it's so much the issue of a national health care identifier. They do have one in Sweden and Norway. They actually don't have one in Japan. They don't have one in Canada. In Canada, you have a provincial identifier. So that's great if you get all your care in Quebec. <laughs> but if you, know, you go over to British Columbia, they have no idea who you are. Uh, so, yes, I think there's some interesting models in other countries that are more about alignment of incentives and the way reimbursement is done that results in better care coordination and quality and less cost. Another question. Uh, my primary care doctor is saying that he never wants uh, me to send him anything, uh, in other words, other records or things that maybe should be part of this chart. Uh, should there be a regulation prohibiting him from uh, not accepting other things into the record? How are we going to kind of keep the interchange between, I mean, we have such a fragmented uh, system as it stands. What will this do for that? Of course, we have two levers, carrots and sticks. <laughs> and so meaningful use is about paying doctors 44000 or 63750 for adhering to the requirements that they do things like share data and receive data from outside sources. And if they don't like the carrot, that's okay. They don't have to accept the carrot because starting in 2016, their pay will be reduced by 1% per year if they don't do this stuff. So you would hope that in the interest of achieving stimulus dollars or avoiding cost cut reductions, the clinicians would adopt these technologies and share data and receive data. Now, ultimately, it is going to be a completely different world, say, five years from now, when we have full accountable care organizations and cat global capitation and patient-centered medical homes. Doctors are no longer going to be paid for giving more care or doing more procedures. They're going to be paid for coordinating care. So at that point, the doctor is going to desperately want data from external sources because that's the only way they'll be paid. Aligning of incentives. Great. Um, what about the patient having a certificate if he, if he wants to send something to his providers to prove who he says he is, and how will that be paid for? And further, if updating these certificates over the years is important, what will tie these patient certificates together with no unique identifier? So, hey, that's a really great idea. And uh, here's how we have done it at Beth Israel Deaconess. We issue credentials to the patient inside the doctor's office. So this is really a poor man's kind of certificate, <laughs> which is to say if you've been seeing Dr. Bob for 15 years, Dr. Bob 
is the trust authority who knows who you are and issues you a set of credentials, in this case a username and secure password that is used to access the data that was generated while you were under Dr. Bob's care. So, you know, sort of imperfect in that that's not a digital certificate, it's a username and password that could be stolen. But here's some other ideas for you. That in the future, uh, there's a project, Sharon, that you've certainly heard about in our meetings called the Direct Project, which is about ways to transmit data securely from point A to point B. Well, turns out that Microsoft Health Vault has embraced this Direct Project that enables doctors to send data at patient request to a secure email address the patient provides. So one way around this is to say certificates will be managed at the doctor's office level and say at the Microsoft Health Vault level. Microsoft establishes a trust relationship with you and then you get an email address that's unique to you for healthcare your doctor's office is sending a secure email using the doctor's office certificate and the Microsoft certificate, and it ends up in your secure web email box. So in that way, you don't have to issue certificates to the individual patient. It just depends upon the patient getting a trust relationship with Microsoft and then passing off a secure email address that's unique to them to the doctor's office to send information to. In the future as well, I've been an advocate of using things like cell phones, you know, something the patient owns as an identity item, you know, because I think as the person who asked the question suggests, issuing 300 million certificates and managing them over the lifetimes of patients is going to be very hard. So I would hope we would come up with other creative means that require not digital certificates for every person, but organizational certificates at a doctor's office and a health information service provider level, like a Microsoft or a Google, a other patient personal health record in the cloud. And then I think what's probably the last question, uh, how about the blurring that's occurring between clinical care and research, which seems to be a good trend in the sense that that information uh, in the clinical setting can be used for the research setting. How do you see in the future uh, you know, and I'll, I'll actually give a personal example of this one. I had uh, oophorectomy at the Brigham, and if I now want that uh, to go to a research project, I'd like to contact them electronically, uh, validate who I am to them, and then uh, ask them to transfer that to a research project. How in the future do you think that would go? Sure. So a couple of models I could suggest. And I'm actually writing a paper about this tonight, so this is perfect. <laughs> So, one is called the patient-centric model, which is to say, I forward all data at every episode of care to you. You then are the steward of that data, and you can share it with clinical trials or clinical research as you want. So that's straightforward. And a Google or a Microsoft or other personal health record provider could support such an approach. Another might be, um, this is part of a PCAST report item that you declare a set of privacy preferences as data is recorded about you. And then, because you have declared that your privacy preferences are to share such data with clinical trials or clinical research when queried, if there is such a thing called, this is getting a little bit in the weeds, but the PCAST report calls it a data element access service, which call it a kind of fancy search engine that's highly secure that a clinical researcher could say, send me data about this particular disease for patients who have consented to release their data. And then that data is released. Another way to do it that wouldn't necessarily require your consent, because it would be anonymized, is that we have something that is part of the Clinical and Translational Science Awards at Harvard called SHRINE that allows me to look at all clinical data across all 17 Harvard hospitals in an aggregate de-identified way and ask questions, such as, of all individuals that had procedure oophorectomy, um, show me their age distribution, or show me uh, if they were taking a certain medicine. And so you can instantly do clinical trials or clinical research on aggregate population data that would never compromise patient privacy and you don't need IRB approval to do that, although, of course, we audit everything you do, and you need to be authenticated and that sort of thing. 
So whether it's patient-centric, whether it's patient preferences declared and then a search engine allowing retrieval or a de-identified aggregate approach, I think you'll start seeing in the next couple of years several ways to empower clinical trials and clinical research that also protect privacy. Checking my question board, it looks like you have answered all the questions, John. So again, I want to thank you. This was absolutely fabulous. We uh, we do record uh, these. Uh, we will be replacing them with a PDF, uh, either from you or that we'll make from the properly formatted slides so that the image is fine uh, and your voice will accompany them. Um, and I also want to bring to our listeners' attention that you will be our innovation video, uh, innovator series video, in about two weeks on our on our website, so we'll be announcing that as well. And again, thank you very much. This was really, really informative. And I live by email, so as you guys do your work, if you have any questions, you know, you can always email me because we're all in this together. Absolutely. And we appreciate your attentiveness, particularly to the patient-centric view. That's really helpful to have you as an advocate out there for the kinds of things we need to do to move health forward in this nation. Great. Thank you, and everyone have a good day. Great, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.